Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris back again at The Ancient Scholar. And today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the general types of snake venom that we run into, or the general mechanism of action of snake venom that we run into here in North America. And the general mechanisms of action can really be divided into two major categories. And then there's a third category where certain snakes uh, can have combinations of uh, different types of venom, uh, where one type of venom may have more predominant effects than the other. But we'll talk about them separately first, just so we can get more of an intuitive understanding of that. So the the general mechanism of action of the, the snake venom encountered in the North America and, and pretty much around the world as well, really falls into one of two categories. The first category is what we call neurotoxic venom. Okay, This is venom that affects the uh, nervous system of particular importance really is the um, the peripheral nervous system. Uh, this is the part of the nervous system that uh, involves uh, voluntary movement, of course, but it also involves um, innervation to uh, vital organs like the or vital organs and muscles and structures uh, such as the diaphragm. And this is the real risk of being exposed to neurotoxic venom is that that venom can exert its toxicity uh, where the nervous system attaches to muscles. And where the nervous system attaches to a muscle, there's something known as a synapse, where you have a very small space in between the neuron and the muscle. And normally what happens is the neuron in the, the end, the terminal end of the axon, contains little vesicles of neurotransmitter molecules. And uh, when we talk about uh, how muscles work, what we're really talking about, we're talking about acetylcholine. So vesicles of acetylcholine are contained within the terminal axon. And those vesicles of acetylcholine are released. Okay, they, they are released into the synapse, and then they attach to receptors on the muscle. Um, in particular, of particular importance are what we call nicotinic um, receptors. And nicotinic receptors are one of two major classes or categories of receptors that uh, are activated, quote unquote, or activated or acted upon by acetylcholine. The other type of receptor is a muscarinic receptor. So what happens is these um, neurotransmitter molecules are dumped out into the synapse. They attach to um, nicotinic receptors. Those nicotinic receptors uh, are generally coupled, uh, in this case, are coupled to sodium channels. And so what happens is when there's a conformational change of those receptors, uh, they cause sodium channels to open up. Sodium channels open up, sodium rushes into the muscle cell, and that causes a muscle cell to depolarize. And then that depolarization moves across the surface of the muscle cell until it hits a structure known as a T-tubule, and then that T-tubule penetrates down into um, the, the deeper parts of the muscle cell, and it actually goes to, um, it penetrates into an area, uh, kind of a, a holding area for calcium known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum, and when that, that the wave of depolarization gets there, it causes a sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium, and then calcium is ultimately what um, uh, what binds to other um, sites, um, specifically sites, uh, tropomyosin binding sites on actin and myosin, and it releases the locking mechanism on the actin and myosin and allows the actin and myosin to pull together, and that's what causes a muscle contraction. So that's a basic mechanism for how neuro, neuro, neurotransmission can cause um, contraction of the muscle. And uh, these neurotoxic venoms interfere with the normal ability, uh, the body's normal ability to do that, and the most disastrous consequence of this um, c tends to be uh, either cardiac or respiratory related, where you are affecting the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and some of the other we call accessory muscles like the sternocleidomastoid muscle and that, and you affect the uh, ability to breathe, and then, of course, that uh, creates a whole um, bunch of problems associated with being able to ventilate and oxygenate effectively. Um, and there are different mechanisms, different venoms, different neurotoxic venoms have 
different mechanisms by which they 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 do this and in some cases we haven't uh we don't have a robust understanding of the mechanism and i can talk about that in a little more detail as we get further on in the playlist um so that that's in general what your neurotoxic venoms do now this other category is um some people call these hemotoxic which literally means blood toxic or cytotoxic which literally means cell toxic um venom and uh i actually prefer the term proteolytic venoms these are uh, venoms that cause lysis or breakdown or dysfunction of proteins in the body and i think that's the broadest way of looking at them you have your neurotoxic and you have your proteolytic and your proteolytic venoms tend to focus on uh proteins obviously proteins in the blood and proteins uh, of the cell membranes and when these venoms interfere with these proteins in the blood we we generally interfere with the ability to effectively clot and these venoms can cause what are known as coagulopathies or clotting disorders and these can cause um loss of platelets or thrombocytopenia for example and that can make us more prone to to um, bleeding and affect our ability to clot effectively um, and you can see where this might be uh, this might be helpful for the the snake uh, if, when it bites say a mouse you know that mouse is unable to clot and then that mouse ends up, ends up experiencing severe internal and possibly external hemorrhage, and it dies as a result of that. Now, the other part of the proteolytic venom is, is that they can affect the cell membrane, and they can they can affect proteins of the cell membrane and cause cell, the cell membrane, in, in essence, to rupture. And we see this with muscle cells in particular. And when muscle cells rupture, they release a lot of molecules out into the bloodstream. One of those molecules is something known as myoglobin. Um, and that myoglobin is kind of a large protein itself, and it can actually clog the kidneys up, and it can cause renal failure. So you have these patients that um, they're having problems clotting. They're having destruction of the tissue. Okay, they're... they're their muscles and their their um, integumentary system is is breaking down um, due to the proteins in those particular cells being attacked by by this proteolytic venom. So you have this you have this uh, cell breakdown. You have this coagulopathy developing, and that tends to be the major toxicity of that particular venom. Okay, so in just to kind of conclude, you have two general types of venom that, that are encountered in, in North American snake bites. You have this proteolytic venom, which tends to cause breakdown of tissue. It tends to affect our ability to clot effectively. And then you have this neurotoxic venom, which tends to affect the peripheral nervous system, and to some extent the central, but the peripheral nervous system. And in particular, it affects our ability to effectively oxygenate and effectively ventilate. So from a medical standpoint, that's where we're most concerned with these, these venoms. Um, and that's where we kind of, uh, that's our starting point. Um, okay, what was the general type of snake involved? And from there, we know that general classes of snakes have these general types of venoms. And we'll talk about these in more detail. But just to complicate it a little more, um, there are certain types of snakes in, in the categories that are traditionally proteolytic that actually can have um, this neurotoxic venom as well. So that can uh, confound the picture somewhat when it comes to treating these patients. But we'll talk about that in subsequent videos. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. As always, thanks for hanging in there, guys.